Okay, guys, real quick, before we get into this episode, we want to let you know what you're about to hear. Now, every year for our other brands, we do what we call a summer freelance summit. We bring in some really fantastic experts to talk about all kinds of interesting and important topics. Uh, And we thought, hey, this is great content. We should be sharing this with our Energize Your Online business audience as well. So we called through, picked out some really fantastic episodes, and that is what you're about to hear. Yeah. And if you hear the term freelancer or freelancing, uh, that's because it's part of our freelance summit. But know that these topics are just as applicable to business owners of all kinds, not just our our freelancing friends. This is some really, really good stuff. We're sure you're going to enjoy it. So stay tuned. Hey, Nick. Hey, hey, hey. Hello. Um, Guys, I'm so excited for you to meet my friend, Nick, who is um, a uh tony winning producer correct correct right like i don't know that um like look at the people i know check me out uh tony winning producer uh he is a business coach he is a yogi master what's the technical like i don't know about master but you know i've been teaching for 20 years so you know <laughs> gotta be close to master um but he is just an all-around dynamo um and he has a lot of stuff to teach he teaches you know storytelling as part of marketing he teaches all kinds of great stuff um but one of the things that i he also teaches is a money mindset and i thought if there's anybody i know who would be fantastic to talk to you guys about this it would be nick and to get his perspective on it and um so yes i'm very excited for you guys to make Nick Demas. So Nick, when you're ready, take it away. Well, that was an, an amazing, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. That was an amazing introduction. First of all, thank you so much, Nikki, for inviting me and into your community because I know what it means to bring somebody in to, uh, to be with your people. And I think we've got a lot of writers here. Am I, is that, is that correct? We're copywriters in this, in this crew. Some freelance in general, but lots of Uh copywriters. Some freelance in general, lots of copywriters. Cool. That's awesome because you're artists like me. (laughs) You're my people. The artists are here. You know, even though we work in the business realm, we're all we're all artists ultimately. And um, I think that that is so cool. So first of all, thank you. We're going to talk today about building a positive money mindset. I think that's what this was sort of framed as, but I want you to think that it's really holistic. Uh, It's really about more than just a mind frame. It's a whole way of being. And I really, um, who worries about money here? Anyone? Anyone worry about, I mean, like, yeah, like who doesn't, it's more like this, put your hand down if you don't worry about money, right? Like we all worry about money. And you may not be even thinking about it in terms of manifestation or, you know, that sort of frame, but I want you to be open today to the idea of co-creation. And we'll talk about what I mean by that, because I know you want to make an impact, right? And I know you want to be rewarded with income in your business. That's why we're in business. Two things, generally, we want to make an impact. First and foremost, for most of us heart-centered people and you artists are heart-centered folk, as well as making income. And that's really what business is all about. I love this quote by our former president. Money is not the only answer, but it makes a difference. It makes a difference because what you can do, what heart-centered people can do when they got the money We all know where money goes, what what you can do when you have money. Imagine if you had the money to make the impact that you wanted to make in the world. What is the difference that you can make? Which brings me to my first question to you. Why? Why do you want money? It isn't for stuff. It isn't just, yes. Look, Nikki can tell you I like my nice things. It's not about not liking nice things. I like a nice car, I like it, but it's not about that, right? There's a deeper meaning. There's something deeper. And when you know your why, you can actually gain some clarity. So there are three areas that we're going to look at today. Three keys to a positive money mindset. Having a growth versus a fixed money mindset. Having an ethical and conscious money and business practices. And co-creating and being abundant. And I'm going to give you some writing assignments to do along the way because, you know, it's what y'all do. 
right? Let me say this before we begin. Wealth is many, many things, and we don't start equal. I think it's really important that we acknowledge that, that we start in different places of, yes, that buzzword privilege, but we start in different places of financial privilege. And we don't start equal. Some of us were born with the silver spoon, and some of us were born not into that type of life. And it's important that we notice that, acknowledge that, but I do believe, very, very firmly believe that we all have the power to move the needle. We all have the power to move forward. We will talk about money. Does this make you uncomfortable? Is money talk uncomfortable for anyone? Yeah, good, good. It's really uncomfortable to discuss money. We have been taught for years not to talk about it. It's shameful. It's back here. It's something that isn't positive. It isn't loving. It isn't whatever that word is for you. It isn't something we discuss. But when we actually dig in and discuss it, we can move our mindset forward to a positive direction. It starts with awareness, obviously. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 is I have a bunch of money issues. I'm in scarcity. I am scared, I'm shameful, I have guilt around money, and 10 being fully abundant. Like, I don't have any money issues, I'm good, I'm all great. Where are you on the scale? On, a, on one to 10, where are you on the scale? And this is not a judgment call, this is really just for you to you know, sort of look, at, look for yourself at where you're at. One, five, three, one, three, four, eight, we got an eight, cool. Vacillate, maybe five, right. Six, seven, depending on the day. I'm so with you. Some days I'm at a six, some days I'm at an eight, right? It really depends on what's going on in my life. Today, our goal is not to jump you to a 10. Let's be, let's be real here, right? Today, the goal is to move you a notch. If you're at a one, let's get you to a two. If you're at a six, let's go to the seven, right? Because, well, close your eyes. Wherever you are, sit and close your eyes for a moment or even look downward just something that you turn inward and visualize what could this do for you? What would this do for you to be able to move one step further out of scarcity towards a positive money mindset? What could that mean for you, for your family, for your life? Where do you feel that in your body? And you may hear yourself say, oh yeah, okay, I, I'm sensing this, but I'm never getting out of debt. I always struggle with money. I'm never going to make money in my business. I'm never going to hit six or seven figures. I should be further along than I am right now. I'll never be able to retire. Yeah, you may be sensing that, but dig in a bit deeper and connect back to that why. You can open your eyes when you're ready. Because a growth mindset will change your money story. All that we were talking about, those are stories. Those are old tapes, right? Those are stories. So we have to question first, do you have a fixed or a growth money mindset? So Stephen Covey is the author of The Seven Habits of a Highly Effective People. Has anybody read this book? <laughs> yeah. He coined this term called scarcity mentality. In this theory, People with scarcity mentality view the world, the entire world, the universe, as a finite pie. And if somebody takes from that pie, there is less for everyone else. So my grandmother, I think of this a lot because my grandmother, when we were kids, there were a lot. I have a lot of cousins. There's 38 of us, 38 grandchildren my, my grandmother had. My, my mother had seven brothers and sisters, huge family. So there's 38. And she would bake these pies, right? And all the grandkids would come running to get the piece of pie that they wanted, right? But my grandmother in her wisdom always had another pie. And it's a really interesting perspective of that the pie is not limited. There's many pies, but we can sometimes get into this idea or this set or this story that there's not enough. A money mindset is your unique set of core beliefs about money 
and how money works in the world. How do you think money works in the world? That's your money story. And it shapes what you believe, what you can do and you can't do with money, how much you're able to earn or maybe how much you're even entitled to. I know for me, for many years, it was hard to receive, hard to receive the money. It's about how much debt you have, your ability to invest. These are the beliefs, right? These are the beliefs. So let's talk about a fixed money mindset versus a growth money mindset. So there's this researcher, Carol Dweck is her name, um, from Stanford. And she said it into two sections, the growth mindset and fixed. So let's talk about fixed first. In a fixed mindset, our abilities, our traits are fixed. Nothing can really, there's nothing we can really do to, to change it. That's how we feel. It's just this way. Have you ever heard yourself say something like, well, that's just the way it is. Anybody guilty of that? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's just the way it is. And being uncomfortable with a setback is difficult for somebody with a fixed money mindset. So somebody with growth, it cultivated. You cultivate this. I want to say this too. Growth just isn't natural. It's not natural to be in the growth money mindset because for years we've been taught how to be scarcity. Even marketing is based on scarcity a lot of the time, right? So we lean into that. So to be growth, you have to actually look at it from a bigger lens. You have to pull back the camera. Like, you know, when you're filming a movie and you watch a movie, the scene's real tight and then they pull back the camera so you can see it bigger. And that's what we need to do here because we don't let failures get us down. We turn them into lessons. We know that we can't solve all the problems, but we need to develop skills and we see room for improvement. So Carol, the researcher from Stanford, did this experiment with a group of high school students. It was fascinating. For group A, the fixed mindset people, she called them group, she called them smart. She told them while whatever they did, they were smart. And the other researchers praised group B and they acknowledged their hard work. So you would think that the people that were told they're smart would have been like the successful ones. But the truth of the matter is that that wasn't the case because they had this fixed mindset in the mind that they were smart, but they actually believed the opposite. And they avoided things, challenges that would jeopardize their intelligence. They even lied to cover themselves because they were so worried about looking and appearing smart. And we do this with money. And in the group B, on the other hand, they were told that they worked hard. So they began to embrace challenges and they, they had this growth mindset that they could do anything because they knew that they could grow into it. Now, the interesting thing is neither, none of us are just one or the other. We're actually a mix. We actually, like this is why the, somebody was saying, oh, I'm a six today, today I'm a seven. Like we vacillate between both. And it's really about bringing some awareness to that, to seeing that. And the number one difference that I see in my students, and I'm sure that Nikki and those of you that teach here can agree with, is their willingness to learn to fail and take that challenge versus running away. So getting honest and real about it is the first step in your money mindset, a positive money mindset. And again, we just want to move it up a notch. So I had a student, I love this story. Anybody, you know, from us Gen, Gen Xers, the Gen Xers in the house, hey, 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 Gen Xers, millennials, okay, okay, millennials, okay, okay, boomer. But Gen X, we're, we're where it's at, right? Guess jeans. This was a very 1980s thing, very 1980s. And I had this student, Jen, and her mother thought, she thought, she, her mother thought she was teaching her this really valuable lesson, right, about money. She was given a huge dilemma. She was told she could have one pair of guest jeans. It was the 80s after all. No judgment here. Or four pairs of the non-designer Levi's. Because let me tell you, in the 80s, designer jeans were like everything, right? You had to have them. So she went for the one pair and wore them over and over and over again. And while we can think that that taught her value, and it did, but it taught her something else. She believed that she could only have nice things, but only a very limited amount of nice things. Like, don't be too showy. Don't be too much. Don't be too big. Don't make your business too big. 
Don't look too big. Don't be too big for your britches, literally. Right? And that played with her for years until she began to go from the scarcity to abundance, from the fix to the growth mindset. So like Jen had to really challenge her beliefs, which we did the work together. It's from when you were young, y'all. It is from when you were young. And personality qualities, of course. And this can be changed. That's the thing you need to know, that your mindset can shift at, and your story, your money story, can shift at any time. When I first bought my, when I bought my first house, I had this great real estate agent. He's like one of those million dollar listing type people, you know, like in New York. This was in New York City when I bought my New York apartment. And I thought I was a hot shot buying a New York apartment, but I was scared to death. Which, by the way, if you go Google it, I'm in the New York Times. In the real estate section, they did this article on me because it was about small spaces. It was a small space that I, that I, that I bought about living big in a small space. So speaking of venture, how interesting is that in terms of scarcity? But it wasn't about the small space. It's about that I was living big in it. And when I went to buy Josh, this real estate, he gave me this great advice. He said, buy more than you can afford. And at the time, I thought, well, he's just trying to get a bigger commission, right? But what I realized is what he meant was, you'll rise up to it. You'll rise to it. And he was completely correct. I rose to the occasion because I put it out there before I was even ready. So ask yourself, where does it come from? Because it's deep rooted. How was it? How was it? How were your parents talk to you about it? Were you even talked about money? Most of us weren't, they didn't, it wasn't even discussed in my household. It was like one of those things that we just don't talk about. How was it spent? What did you hear? What did you think? What did you believe? And most importantly, what did you feel? How did, how did your parents talk about other people's money? That's a big one too. Were you on the wrong side of the tracks? You know, did they willingly pay their taxes? Do you willingly pay your taxes or do you bad mouth it every year? Complain about corruption or maybe it's more subtle. Like, oh, it's a shame we couldn't buy you that car. That was my parents, it's such a shame. So the first exercise for you to really think about here is write, sit down and write your money story. What were you taught about money? And, wh and what I mean by this is go back to when you can first remember the value of money. What was the first thing you heard? and write out your story and your relationship with money from then until today. For those of us that are in Gen X, it may take us a few days, right? Because we're a little older, but go back and rewrite them, rewrite it out. And you'll notice patterns. It'll be very interesting to you. So that's the first assignment for you. But the second key today is money is ethical and consciousness. To move to a growth mindset and shift your money story, it A, begins with awareness, but B, is the knowledge that money is ethical and consciousness, and conscious in our consciousness. So do you think of money as good or bad? When you think of money, is it good or is it bad? Because really, it's a tool. It's a tool and can be for good. We get a lot of judgment around, around wealth, right? And wealthy people. And you may, you may associate it with greed or a lack of ethics or taking more than their fair share. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's very, very true, but oftentimes it's actually not because there are a lot of ethical, not so great people that are poor too, right? And we sort of forget that. And this kind of judgment, when you judge others, indicates actually a lack mentality. It's a perception that in some way, you set up a power dynamic. And it creates resentment. It builds this imbalance. You're giving away your power. If you believe those that are wealthy are undeserving and unethical, you're actually blocking money coming to you. In a way, money is a value for what you stand for. Because why? 
Money is an exchange of energy. Money is an exchange. You're trading value for value. That's how we exchange energy now. Maybe it didn't used to be that way, but that's how we do it now in culture, right? By valuing yourself and your skills and pricing yourself accordingly. Let me say that again for the back. <laughs> and pricing yourself accordingly. I'm sure Nikki, yeah, Nikki's nodding her head and giving me a big thumbs up here, right? You're adding value to someone's life. Let me go into that a bit. The money you receive is a value to you, right? And you, so the support you give the clients is the value to them. This is far from being unethical or even unspiritual or any kind of unconscious behavior. The value exchange is ethical trade. And it's an, even an act for good. Now, what can come up here for many people is the big I, imposter syndrome. The big is, is imposter syndrome, right? Anybody feel that way? Well, I'm not sure I'm good enough. Yeah, I got, got a hand go up. Amanda's like, me, <laughs> hello, right? I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure I'm worthy yet. I'm not, et cetera, et cetera. Variations on this theme will come up. But in fact, when you undercharge your customers and clients, you're denying them of valuing themselves. You're denying them of needing to step up for themselves. You're creating this circle of scarcity that continues on and on. My student, I had the student Lee, she's um, an intuitive coach. And recently she had this realization in her business because, and it was profound for her because it shifted the entire way she looked at her business because she realized that by not actually asking her clients to pay, she was holding them back. Whoa. And you'll be doing the same for your clients and are doing the same for your clients. Yeah, Nicole says, that's the mindset I'm trying to break, that I'm not worthy. I have to keep reminding myself that I am worthy. Yeah. First of all, I am. Take the worthy off. I am. You are. Just for being here, just for being you, you are worthy. Just for what you have to be. People buy you, by the way. Yes, you're copywriting. You need the skills. That's not what I'm saying. Yes, you need, as all you freelancers out there, yes, you need to know what you're offering. You need to know what you're offering. But simply by being you, that's who they purchase from. We buy from people. The exchange of energy is your energy and exchange. That's really the cashish, which we're going to get to in a second. Cashish. What was that? Cashish. Yeah. So living and working ethical and conscious practices will create abundance. We have this false perspective that if we're ethical, well, we'll get trampled on. Right? But that's not actually the case. And I know that you want to be, by being in Nikki's crew, I know that you're the type, the type of person that wants to be, feel proud and worthy of, the, of receiving it because you're going to want to work in a way that's conscious, right? I know that based on who you have as your fierce and fearless leader here. So the second is, what is the value of the transform, transformative service you provide? This is your second writing assignment. What is the value of the transformative service you provide? This is the question I want you, once we leave today, take, take some time and sit with this. Because when you understand your value, everything shifts. Everything shifts because you don't feel like the energy exchange is uneven on either end. That you're not giving too much because some of us tend to be over givers, right? Or take too much. It feels like a very ethical exchange because money is ethical and conscious when used as a tool for good. And then the third thing I want to talk about today is co-creating through your story attracts money. And abundance. 
So how many times, speaking of giving and receiving, have you heard it's better to give than to receive, right? Who grew up with this story? Who didn't grow up with this story? <laughs> it's better to give than to receive. And I, I remember the first time this happened to me when I remember her, hearing it. I was six years old and my brother was three. And my brother being in these stories is important because we lived in Glendive, Montana. Yes, Glendive, Montana. And um, the, the name of the town lives up to itself. Dive. Uh, and my brother and I, we were fighting over a cookie. And my mother said to me, well, you've got to give it up. You're the older brother. Because it is better to give than to receive. Well, this set me up for a lifetime of overgiving, of always acquiescing. And as writers and as artists, we are prone to excessively giving. And you're not alone. You are not alone in this. It's a widespread mode of doing the life and work. I mean, how many times have you been asked to do something for free, right? Oh gosh, yeah, I'm getting, yeah, 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 yeah. I used to have, um, I used to have, uh, in my theater career, people used to come to me and say, hey, can I pick your brain? I'm just getting itchy, just at the thought of somebody coming up to me and saying, hey, will you pick my brain? And I would always be like, uh-huh, sure. And they would say, hey, can I take you for coffee? And at first I would go for coffee, or I would say, sure, sure, sure. And then, it, then eventually I got tired of that. I said, well, I don't drink coffee. And they would say, well, can I take you for tea? Because they always thought that was the, the, what I meant. <laughs> so I would go for tea. And what would happen is I would give them a bit of advice for free to pick my brain. And then I'd get really pissed off, to be honest, because they wouldn't take the advice or they'd take a piece of it, right? They would use a piece of it. And then they'd be like, well, well that didn't work. And meanwhile, I realized that I was giving 25 years of experience for a cup of tea. For a cup of tea. It wasn't the, the hour that I, was, that I was giving them. I was giving them 25 years of experience for the price of a cup of tea. And I had to say, the tea ain't free, boo. The tea ain't free anymore. Right? I have to value myself and my time and my 25 years of experience so that it is equal exchange. Because it's depleting to overgive. And receiving is even more challenging because it requires a level of vulnerability. Receiving requires a level of vulnerability. And you can start by practicing and receiving in small ways. Like a highly effective practice is to start accepting compliments. How many times have you gone, oh, well, thanks, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, that's okay, yeah, huh, right? Your hair looks great. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh well, I, you know, I mean, I, I just got a cut, but I'm not really sure about it. Well, my hair is, always looks great because I don't have any. But you know what I'm saying. And it's about accepting. It's about accepting. Receive. And sometimes it comes in the form of asking for help. Right? That's not always easy. When I first... Went to New York, I was 19 years old. I just got off a national tour. I was going to Broadway and I had a period where I was so poor y'all that I was eating Ritz crackers with sal saltine crackers and Ritz crackers with butter for a week. But I was too proud to accept or receive money from my parents. Probably from all the years they set up all that stuff that we were talking about, a lot of there, right? That they set up. But co-creation is actually energy exchange, as we were saying. The truth is no one does it alone. There is no such thing as a self-made millionaire. That is the biggest narrative story I've ever heard in my entire life. It's just not true. Nobody does it alone. Nikki can tell you that there is a team behind all of this. There are people that have come in to collaborate. Yeah, thank you. 
God, thank goodness, we both have these great, amazing teams, right? That it, there's, there are people that have come to collaborate with you. Everyone's helped along the way. And you must be open to receive the help and co-create with the entirety of the universe. Well, how do you do that? You start by sharing your truth, sharing your story of who you are. Remember when I said money comes to you, people buy from money. They want to know who you are. They want to know your story. That's where the real money is, is in your story. And your job, your job is to help people find their message. What's your messaging? What's your messaging about who you are? Because your clients, yes, they're going to come through some ninja marketing techniques. Yes, sure, sure, sure. But they're going to come through the connections that you make. It's about connecting to people. And the best way to do that, your superpower, is your story. Your story is your superpower. And you may be like, I don't I don't know what my story is. What is he talking about? It doesn't need to be homelessness, addiction, or abuse. If you have that, okay, sure. But it doesn't need to be that. Simple, relatable stories connect you to others. It is your uniqueness that draws people to you. And that goes back to that why. Remember when I started this and I said, what's your why? That's part of your story. Your why. They will want to collaborate with you. They want to pay you to be with you. So begin sharing your story. Begin by sharing your story and you will shift to a positive money mindset. So what would, what would be possible for you? I want to hear in the chat, what would be possible for you if in six months, if you started to collaborate with others, you started to collaborate, what would be possible for you? by sharing yourself, by sharing your story, by sharing who you are. Really feel that, sense that. Like, what is possible for your business if you begin sharing yourself? And if you want to move to this abundant mindset, be abundant. B, capital B, capital E, be abundant. Be abundant. B-E, abundant. Remember that? Yeah, be abundant. Invite others to collaborate. Nikki did. Look, I'm here with Nikki collaborating. That's abundance. You'd have too many clients to handle. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. So the third exercise for you is to create a list of potential collaborators. And it's not going to necessarily look the way you think it is. Because on paper, Nikki and I aren't, aren't necessarily like exactly the same what we do, who we, who we serve, but yet we have this overlap that she saw, that she witnessed. So she put me on her list, right? It draws in new people for her and for me, and it's this beautiful collaboration. Through our story, we connected. We connected at a business conference through our stories, through our shared experience. And you'll do the same with your customers and your clients when you know your why. So if you followed, having a belief and growth money, money mindset is important. Living ethically and conscious money and business practices and co-creating, co-creating with all things and sharing your story. Collectively, these will begin to shift you into a positive money mindset. And I give you three homework assignments. Go do the homework <laughs> as it really will help you shift. Let's take some questions now. And you can follow me at the Nick Demas. That's where I'm at. But we'll say that again at the end. Awesome. So. Yay. Uh, okay. We'll dig into questions. Um, and there's one thing I want to say, though, too. That just popped into my head when you were talking about the uh, picking your brain. And you the, the tea is not free, boo. Um, you have 25 years of experience, but guys don't discount, you know, if you're not at 25 years of experience, don't discount the time and the effort that you, if you're at one month of experience, if you're at two at three, you know, you put in oh, yeah. a of effort to learn. I mean, oh yeah. It's not about time. It's not about time. That wasn't the point of that, that story. Really. It was about the fact that I had experience that wasn't being valued, mm -hmm. right? No matter what the amount of time is, 
If you've been in business a week, the tea ain't free, boo. Mm -hmm. Hells yeah. Hells yeah. And Louise says money equates to so many ethical and religious beliefs. It's scary. Yeah. It's very tied, right? Like it's so tied together. Sort of how we were raised is tied, tied in that, like in terms of our belief system. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to step back the lens and, and dismantle it a bit and look at it. Is it true? Is this a belief? Mm -hmm. Right? Because what's a belief? A belief is a set of, of facts that we've chosen to believe collectively. But a belief is not true. A belief is a belief, and that belief can be shifted at any point. It's not a fact. It's actually mm -hmm. not a fact. It's something that can be shifted at, every t at any point. Yeah. Well, I love your point about money being a tool because there's, I forget who said it, and it held me, it was you. But, um, you know, if you think of tool, it's, it's all on how you use it. So like a knife can be used to hold up a liquor store or a knife can be used to cut a child's birthday cake, right? It's all totally. in how you use it. Yeah, totally. And Jennifer says, if your prices for your services are too low, it could be that you do your work grudgingly. That is so true. The energy you put into it is negatively tinged and it comes out in the product. Product uh, Easy to understand the abstract and in practice, wow, it's hard. Got to really practice belief. Um, There's two things I want to say about pricing too low because pricing is always a question, right? We are constantly like, well, what do I price it as? What do I price? I don't know how to price this. You know, I mean, that's a big part of what we go through. And there are two parts to this. One is I have found in my experience, and I can only speak from mine, but you can also talk on this, Nikki. When I price too low, people didn't value it. They didn't value. They didn't show up for themselves because they didn't believe it was that worthy, ultimately, or they were that worthy for it. And I had more cancellations, problems with credit cards on the lowest ticket item I ever had than I ever did on the high, have had on the higher ticket items, right? How interesting is that? Because the higher the ticket item, the more somebody said, oh, this is something I'm investing in myself in. And I believe in this. And I believe in myself to invest in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a business owner, and I know you feel the same way, Nick. If someone prices something out for me and it's super low, I go, mm, mm. now I don't trust you. Yeah. Now you're so green that you don't know how to price your services. And if you're that green, that you don't know how to price your services, then I'm concerned about the quality of your services. Totally. It's almost like, is this, I'm not sure this is going to be any good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'd be like, I, if an electrician came over to your house and was like, oh, I can rewire all of this to the whole house for 40 bucks. Wouldn't you be like, I think I'm going to find somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. 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 Um, Phil says, I asked a recent client for feedback after a very challenging logo design. And she said, I want you to embrace your talent and stop undervaluing yourself. Wow. What a client. That's incredible. Um, yeah. And Kate says, hold on. Love that. That. Yes, that is amazing. I like talk about an insightful client. Um, and Kate, do you want to talk to your, your comment, your question? Before you hopped on, we were talking about how Kate, who is our marketing manager and, and one of my, I was going to say one of my right hands, one of, one of my hands. You have multiple right hands. Um, they're both right. Um, yes. Yeah, so we were talking about how we, we just recorded a podcast going through my numbers and because last year was my best year as a freelancer and the number, which I won't say now, we'll wait for the podcast to come out, but it was it was high. Like it, it felt too high for me. And so I, I was re dug into some of the guilt I felt because 2020 was such a difficult year for so many people. Um, and so what I'm saying now is, as you were chatting uh, or talking, I feel like it's more, um, more need to focus on letting go of what people think of that number um, and the judgment that they may have with that number and, you know, I wrote, you know, or the mother-in-law that may expect more visits or start spending my money for me, um, because I think that's, to me, a, a worry of when I start discussing money with anyone, that they then feel like, oh, if you make that much, you should be able to do this, or you should be able to do that. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts around blocking what other people think of <laughs> your money, and which is very, you know, how you spend it, I think, is personal to you. Yeah. Um, what do you care? What do you care what they think? 
you know, this goes back to that idea of worth, of our value of ourselves. When we are, when we are in our why, going back to that why, when you know your why, it doesn't matter. Why are you doing it? Who is it for and what is it for, right? Because what other people say, they're going to say all kinds of things, as we all know. Anybody who's ever been on the internet knows that everyone has an opinion, right? And consequently, just like we have to let go of whatever those opinions are about what other, what other, the opinions of other people are none of my business, that kind of thing, same with what it is about money. Money is just a microcosm for the greater macrocosm of your own life. And Sarah says, Nick, should we be giving some advice away for free on social media to support our relationships and equate that to a marketing expense? Yeah, okay. So this is always a question for people, right? Like, how much do I give? How much do I not? We had the same issue on Broadway. When we decided to begin filming shows for Broadway, I'm going to give you a little Broadway analogy. And there was a big concern that if people watched it on TV or watched it in the movie theater, that they then wouldn't want to come see the show. What actually happened is the exact opposite. What happened was, is it brought more desire and, and need and want for the show. So yes, you give an amuse-bouche. You, give, you don't give the appetizer. You don't give the main course. You don't give dessert. You give a taste. You give them that free taste that you get at the tasting menu that the chef says, oh, this is for you, so that you whet their appetite to come. Is that helpful? Well, and even, that. even this, this is a very clearly very helpful and very valuable from Nick. And he's given us our time, his time, and but this is also very clearly not the entirety of everything that he has to teach, right? And some people are saying, yes, I've already followed you on Instagram now. I've had to pop over and follow you, um, and not, you know, not that then, but but people, when you share a bit of yourself, people want more. When you share a little bit. People want to know, and especially good stuff, you know, when you share something useful, interesting, people go, oh, I want more. This was fantastic. Uh, I hope that, uh, quite frankly, I hope that Nick really, well, he, he did for me, and I hope that he challenged all of you, all of us, to, to really examine how we think about our income, how we think about the value that we provide and how we show up in calls with their clients, not as like, oh, oh, but as this is what I have to offer. Let's see if what you have to offer is commensurate to it. <laughs> let's, let's see if it's, there's the energy exchange, right? It yeah. really does go back to that. Mm -hmm. It really does. Yeah. So. Yes. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for listening and participating and asking questions and being so present. I, um, I love it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Nick. This was wonderful. I knew it would be, but of course I'm still, still blown away. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in. Do you want to learn how to sell and scale your offer on autopilot every single day without the chaos of live launching or the low conversions of evergreen? Who doesn't, right? Get our free on-demand video training at circuitsalesystem.com slash free. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel to make sure you never miss a video. We'll catch you next time.